In this video, I'm gonna talk about no budget filmmaking. What do you need to do in order to make a film? How much money or how little money do you need? Who am I? I'm Johnny from Wallstrom. My last film, The Pearl of Africa, sold to Netflix. If you're new around here, consider subscribing. This channel is all about documentary filmmaking. But now, let's start the show. Yay! Okay, we're live. Um, nobody's filmmaking, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I've done a couple of those, I feel. Like my first film uh, was just shot like super low budget. That sold to Swedish TV, it went to festivals. Uh, I made a short film long before that, that went to uh, Festival of the Cannes, which is uh, a fiction film, so before I made documentaries. So I thought I would talk a little bit about these like mixes of, of things that I've done, because my last film, The Pearl of Africa, was also no budget filmmaking. So ask questions, um, but what do you do when you have no budget? I just thought, or I've always had this mindset, uh, ever since I read a book called uh, A Rebel Without a Crew, I think that's what it's called, by Robert Rodriguez, um, it's actually, oh, I gotta change up this, this text here, because this is saying Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera. Okay, let me just switch the title. No, but anyway, I, w I was watching that um, film, uh, El Mariachi, and then I heard that there was a book that Robert Rodriguez had written about uh, low-budget filmmaking. So I just like was sold straight away. And ever since I read that book, if you haven't read that book, read it. Uh, it's an amazing book that really everybody that's interested in filmmaking has to read. It's that simple. It's just like perfect in terms of inspiration. Uh, and I've always based like everything I've done uh, has always been based around that. Uh, like all the inspiration and everything I, uh, that I take uh, comes from his mentality to things. So that led me to like, okay, so should I just like be complaining or waiting for somebody to just like give me a chance to do something um, but I didn't think that that was the way I just felt like okay so I just start telling stories and then we'll see what happens after that so that's how I looked at uh, this whole equation of like making your first film and then I started making films uh, and eventually like things happen you know uh, you get a little bit of a break uh, and then it just gets rolling but let me know what your uh, thoughts on, on all of that is. Let me just see, because I'm not seeing this stream. So let me just double check. Uh, but the first question I got was uh, a film collaboration asked, uh, please define no budget, since it really doesn't exist. Uh, even if somebody lends... Uh, the filmmaker a camera, a lens and a microphone. At a minimum, there are logistics, food, communication, data storage, expenses. There's massive resourcefulness needed. Uh, please, share what you're please share what kind of films people can expect to make on a no budget. Uh, as always, curious to your insightful thoughts. So, I think that... like. Uh, the big thing when you're defining no budget is that there's definitely not a budget that you can look at. I would just say that like depending on your level, like of course it's going to be different. Sometimes it's, it's actually having a budget, other times it's zero budget, other times you have the equipment. It's totally up to like the person making it to define it, I think. But of course, like there's a threshold. Like I would say that my films, all of them, are no budget. None of them has had funding until they were done. Uh, so everything was done uh, on like a shoestring uh, budget until we got into festivals. This uh, usually is like the way that I worked with films. So until then, we keep everything like low, 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 low. 
And then with my film that I'm making now, which is more a proper film where you get a development grant and stuff in the beginning, that's something that like it changes a little bit because you don't have to take risks and chances in the same way. But I don't think that today, like money shouldn't be a problem uh, at all. Like everybody can get hold of a camera. If you can't afford one, you can borrow one, definitely. Like there is not a human on this earth that can't borrow a camera. That's at least what I feel. Um, so if you really want to tell stories, then like it shouldn't be that, that shouldn't be an obstacle at all. So uh, I think like everybody has to define their own way of like no budget. But for my first film, uh, Zero Silence, my first doc, it was made like just with my own gear. It was made just with our own money until the Arab Spring happened. And that was three years into the project. At that time, we had like spent the money on travel and all that ourselves. And then eventually we got a small uh, pre-sale to a TV channel. And that made it possible for us to, to finish the film. But what usually happens when you get to that stage is that all the money disappears in post-production and distribution. So you don't get any money. So I would say that most money that I've made off of my films have all gone into the production and I haven't made uh, a penny out of them. So in that sense, I would say all of them are like zero budget. Uh, even though like in the end some money came in but everything went out to like an editor or uh, whatever it is post-production services or all that stuff or licensing of material so everything just goes away anyways uh, so in terms of shooting and capturing the story it all comes down to just like nailing the whole production making it on as low of a cost as you can in order for you to get to the stage where you have like a rough cut and you can start pitching it and you can start getting money inside of the project. Sometimes the film isn't good enough and you can't get money inside, but um, I'll talk more about like that whole thing uh, a little bit later, I think. Um, but let's just look at like, or well, look, let's talk a little bit about like some filmmakers that came from low budget. So I talked a little bit about Robert Rodriguez. If you, if you have the chance, uh, search for El Mariachi Breakdown. Uh, there's like he has li this 10 minute film school. I think it was on the DVDs of El Mariachi way back. So that film school is pretty freaking amazing, just because it's it's just him going through how he cut uh, uh, in his head while he was shooting. And I think that's like a crucial thing if you do fiction especially but also documentary being able to see how you edit things like that's a, a really insightful way of looking at it and i i think that anybody that comes from like a doc perspective maybe wouldn't think that like that's the way that you should think when you shoot things in docs but i think you should uh, be able to like grasp where a situation is dead and don't shoot all day and then throw everything away most of the stuff that I shoot, I use in the films. So there's nothing that like goes to waste most of the time. Um, and I think that's how you need to be like efficient if you want to make low budget films. Because otherwise you're spending the crucial time that you have a little bit of that you can invest because that's the only resource you have. Time is everything. But if you don't use that wisely, you're going to spend it on like crappy uh, characters or just like story narratives that doesn't make sense and all that. So that's uh, a crucial thing to figure out. Uh, and another is like uh, Linklater uh, who made Slacker. That's also like a super low budget film that I think everybody should watch from like to get a perspective of that day and age. Because um, that film, uh, there is also an interview with him, I think, where he talks about it that you can Google uh, or YouTube. Um, but another one that I think most people probably have watched is like there's a bad taste documentary that's about how um, bad taste was made. And if you haven't seen bad taste, you should probably go see it and, and see how that whole film was made. But all of these like big shot filmmakers came from like this background. All of them are like Hollywood filmmakers. 
and Christopher Nolan as well like Christopher Nolan who makes Batman came from like doing the following which is like a low budget thing and even though like these have more budget than we would have uh, for instance I think like Tarantino's first film um, was like was it 10 million or something US somebody probably knows who can correct me on that but like that's so crazy how like that could be considered to be like low budget because there's no doc uh, outside of the big blockbusters that are being made that are like in that range so like doing a doc uh, usually like a low budget uh, european production might be around like 250 to 300k uh, and most people that make it like on no budget they would make it around like i don't know i i would say you can probably make it for like 50k or something uh, and people won't get paid but you would have all the exp expenses and all that in that uh, but on the other side you can also make it for nothing but the end result will probably suffer um, if you're not a genius uh, okay so just talking about like the films that i made i made zero silence with uh, 5d mark ii so i don't have that camera anymore but that's like worse than all the cameras out there today that you probably can buy uh, so in terms of like comparing uh, the quality of everything i thought that it would be interesting if i showed you uh, some progression here like how uh, pearl of africa looks and how zero silence looks which is the the first film and then the film before that which was a fiction film uh, and a short film uh, so let me just show you first of all pearl of africa if you have seen it um, i think i'll just show a scene and then i'll start talking in the middle of everything um, so let me see here we go one two bye bye Oh, Nelson, this is an exercise for me. Oh, yeah, don't enjoy it so much. <laughs> oh, this is a very beautiful sight. Okay, so this whole scene here. This was shot a mix with like Blackmagic Pocket uh, cinema camera, the first one, not the one that is in the media now. And then it was shot with the, uh, the Canon 5D Mark III with the Magic Lantern firmware. And there's, they're cut across, like the start of the scene is Blackmagic Pocket cinema camera. This I think is the 5D material. And then like everything is intercut and it's partly on a little stabilizer that I, ha I have here. And then uh, all I have is basically a small recorder that does like dual audio. And then I have uh, wireless mics. One of the wireless mics in this scene just like it didn't work. So there is basically one mic for this whole scene. Uh, so let me just like put the sound back on. <laughs> you, you can't just smile. <laughs> Don't do this. This is just for my camera. I won't trade it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I promise. I don't trust your pictures. <laughs> do this. Go out. Huh? They always go out. Please. For you me. Honey, for me. Honey. Oh, son. Be good. Okay, so Cleo has uh, a mic and Nelson doesn't have a mic. So, and I'm pretty far away, so this wireless mics and they're crap. Um, okay, so this whole scene is basically one of the nicest scenes, I think, that, uh, that is in the film. And like anybody could achieve this uh, with the right type of gear today. Uh, it's just a matter of like capturing the people in, in a situation and everything. And I think that makes it difficult because everybody doesn't have like the experience that I have from making or when I was making that film I had already made films for over 10 years uh, so I thought I would show you like my first short film out of like when I came out of um, film school uh, we were three people like doing everything together on this film 
I was more like doing the DOP stuff on production, but then around everything we were doing, like the directing together and writing the script and all that. Uh, so let me just show that. So you see like the progression and this is like HDV. So any phone <laughs> would probably be better than this today. Uh, just to show you. Okay, let's go. basically this this is about like she finds keys to a car uh, with um, a tape recorder inside and the tape recorder says that she should leave this car uh, to his son so he jumped and then yeah uh, but this whole thing was shot like with a small crew of I don't know how many we were we were probably in the crew maybe like six people or something everybody was staying in in a uh, house in the north of sweden for like 18 days and all this was like this was no money at all in this project everything was self-funded and it all came down to like having a good location and having this car so we got the car for like 500 bucks and then we had to ship it on a train up to the north of Sweden which is like 20 hours north of here uh, and then we drove up there and then we stayed there for like 18 days and it was like a small crew and everything was like closely resourced all the money that we like spent we had a camera and we had some gear but most of the stuff we actually got a deal with a rental uh, thing uh, up in the north of uh, of Sweden and then we went there and we shot this uh, just with the car mainly as as like a character in itself and then um, all this uh, driving around and then another character comes into the whole thing as well and it's like a road movie type of thing so that was shot on shitty equipment but actually with a bigger crew much bigger like 10 times as big because it was just me shooting the Pearl of Africa. So it's not really about like how big of a crew or how much money you have or, or anything like that or what the costs are. Making that short, that's like a 26 minute short. Making that was so much more costly than making all of my films, like uh, wait, which are documentaries. Because I've made them on, because I don't have resources, I've made them myself. So I've shot everything myself. I've been just like learning everything um, over the years. And then eventually you can do that. Uh, but it's something that you need to be really resourceful with in terms of like what you can do with the little uh, resources you have. Um, yeah. But Ruben Lopez asked, I would like to know what keeps you going. Um, you said you went bankrupt after your first film yeah that was the uh, the f f film i showed you the short film fiction film uh, where can you summon the strength to keep going at a phase of bankruptcy or were you okay throughout the whole film until uh, the end actually it was fine until we got into post-production so shooting it was fine and then all of a sudden we kind of just like the whole crew went uh, just totally nuts on location. So there was just so much stress from making that film. And then like on top of that, it didn't make any money, like no shorts make any money. So yeah, I was lucky to just like get a, a big job for like commercial type of, uh, I don't know, like films for a company and then I made that and that actually started like the process of, of me getting to know the people that were in my first uh, documentary so that was actually a good thing but then I also got a second job to pay the bills for a while and then that kind of got me up on my feet again and then I knew that okay I need to save up money to have a uh, like a, a big uh, buffer so I wanted to have like six months at least of a buffer 
before I left that second job just because I wanted to be free to do whatever I wanted to do and then that's how I've seen things like ever since then I still want to have that type of buffer probably a year nowadays uh, but then sometimes you run out of that sometimes you have a bad year and you're out of that money and you need to start all over that's the way my career has been like I invest in things like I invest in my new film and then you're back uh, at the same spot eventually where you're like putting everything up front and then you're not getting it back enough or speedy enough mm. but i would say like the the most important resource is time and as long as you have that which i think most people have then you should be fine like time is something that you need to manage that's what i uh, learned to do after a while and like anybody that hasn't listened to the war of art listen to it Stephen Pressfield that helps you so freaking much in terms of like getting on point with things uh, yeah so are so Ferrero I don't know this are so Ferrero Werner Herzog was also self-taught. He stole a camera from Munich University to film uh, Choir Wrath of God. Everyone should attend his online masterclass. Yeah, it's kind of funny this. I actually did this. <laughs> I stole I stole like film equipment when I went to university for like five thousand dollars and then i started making films and i'm actually making a film about it now and i just pitched it to swedish television so we'll see how that goes but it's actually hilarious that he did this as, as well um i don't promote stealing but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do that university was just bullshit anyways but Werner herzog amazing i love that man so watch uh, any film he's made like he's fantastic uh, okay so what's important when you do no budget films I would say like the most important thing is to work with what you have and not like you can have imagination sure but like keep your feet on the ground and, and make uh, make an effort to actually making the film rather than uh, having like a big vision I think that's like a big mistake that people make they start the project and they don't work from what they have that's what we learned when we made like the fiction short films because we always had like inspiration in sweden a lot of swedes uh, at that time that was like prominent filmmakers was doing like docu styled fiction and they had like a process that was like a, a platform for how they made their films and funded them and made them on like development grants but then they made a whole film off of that uh, and then they went to all the big festivals like uh, and had a, like a huge success so we just looked at those and kind of got inspired by that and and did everything from that uh, and i've just continued working like that now as well um, but I think like look at those limitations that you have and then you need to develop a style from that. So depending on like what camera do you have, if you have a terrible camera, then maybe you can shoot black or uh, black and white or something. Um, that's how people used to do it. Like if they didn't have a good enough camera, then they shot black and white. Um, but there's a ton of things that you need to kind of adapt to. If you don't have dynamic range, don't try to shoot like high dynamic range type of, of environments. Uh, and don't shoot at night if you can't light things uh, and have a crappy camera. You need to kind of adapt like your ID to that if you want to succeed. Um, and like when you have, for instance, certain resources, I would cost people that have the resources for documentaries. So if, if I don't have money, I look at like, okay, so what type of like exotic or cinematic story can come from this character like where does he or she have to live what type of uh, things do they have to do once i find those and i know that like because what i know from having made a couple of films is that you need to have everything in a documentary character in order for you to get it visually like you can't direct somebody to go out on a boat just because you want a nice boat scene then the whole story needs to like come 
uh, together in that sense and, and like everything needs to be uh, in that way you can't just like write like make up scenes and hope that they will happen so usually i would just like research a lot and then for instance like the project we're making now like first we went to Lofoten and we casted this fisherman up there and then once we got there and we were out on a boat and it was just like oh perfect and then eventually we went to Kino and then uh, in Kino we knew that like these are very eccentric and it's a very special unique place and, and all that and uh, I just cast from what I want in terms of scenes and how visually cinematic or, or all that um, I can get out of a character I look at the character to get that so if you don't have all the resources to make like a big production look at the character and what you can find while casting instead um, and maybe have some fun too on that boat or whatever uh, yeah so just look at that just look at okay what type of car do they have okay can you do something with that or do they have a canoe all those things try to build like cinematic scenes out of the character um, and also make it personal because that is always cheaper <laughs> like personal always works it's the most cost effective thing to do I think to look at how can you do it uh, more personal and more like uh, suggestive and subjective in terms of like telling a personal story because you don't need a lot of resources to tell personal stories you just need that voice and story um, and then you need to have a lot of patience um, and plan from the resources not imagination um, how can we make okay uh, let me see who this is uh, Mutas Mohammed how can we make amazing cinematic light with no budget that's really uh, that really matters uh, everything else I can solve camera and sound yeah the thing is light is everything like light is all the mood all the scenes like if you have a shitty camera light is so important just in order for you to expose correctly like it's such a, a big thing to have correct light for no budget films it's more important to do that uh, like it's more important to care about the light if you want to create a style from no money like all is based on that uh, in the end because you have the limitations in in lighting things and, and all that so I would mainly just work with the light so I would work with the locations and the light that is good there I would definitely shoot in the times where the light is like you want it to be in terms of style or mood or whatever um, but just to like show you two examples um, that are shot for instance with a black magic pocket cinema camera like this little one um, if you go and you go to Vimeo and you search for too beautiful Macy or Frost I can actually put it in the chat for you guys but for anybody watching afterwards not so much uh, let's see so now I'm on a different computer of course so I need to write and hope it will be correct Vimeo.com. So what I'm looking for here is you to tell me if this film looks like it's shot on a black magic pocket cinema camera. So this film is uh, my brother worked on this as well. Uh, he did uh, the festival release and the PR and everything. Uh, and it's a friend of ours that did it. So let's see. 27037 Okay, there it goes. So check that out. Too beautiful, but may say of frost. Amazing trailer on Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. Uh, this version here, the old one. So he shoots big commercials for like IKEA, I think, and like HM, like BMW like massive commercials tons of money all of it is shot on Alexa 
and he went and he made his first feature film now uh, and it's shot on the pocket cinema camera that is a choice like that he could have shot it on an Alexa or whatever but he shows that one it's a camera that cost if you go to eBay it costs like 500 or like 400 bucks it all comes down to actually going out and learning the tools and light is one of those crucial tools if you watch that trailer you can see like this is somebody that actually can handle light because a pocket cinema camera that you can shoot around like 400 ISO you really need to know like what you're doing in order to capture that type of image um, and I don't think that everybody can do like that type of film but there's others for instance like if you look at the trailer for uh, Island and the Whales by Mike Day he was in uh, competition with us at, at Toronto with uh, the Pearl of Africa uh, that film is in the Faroe Islands he shot all of that on the Blackmagic pocket cinema camera and, and all by himself as well so very similar to, to ha uh, how I shoot and like that film it, it looks fantastic especially the trailer but th the whole film looks fantastic um, and especially given that he didn't light anything he just went out and he shot it on a 400 ISO type of camera that's that's something special um, and I would say that like that type of projects it just comes down to like having shared determination and a little bit of talent if you want to do something that is like that good and have patience um, and I think both of those films are definitely shot in the right time of day where you can get the right light uh, that's like massive if you want to shoot on a, on a limited camera and that's what you need to shoot on if you want to make no budget films um, but looking at those projects I, I would say like there is no way that gear matters like there's no way it comes down to like talent and everything um, I think that's just like the, the biggest thing is just like work on your craft make stuff all the time become better and then eventually you hit like your project that makes it a success um, okay so Mr. Vipedis I would be mainly interested in getting light and sound into my films for low or no money uh, but also what topics to make films about uh, some that don't cost you anything and are great for starters yourself your family and friends and what else um, yeah light and sound I think if you if you look at we can play Zero Silence for you that film was shot with just like a lab the whole thing and it's just controlled like that more interviews I've moved away from that now but just to show you how you could do it because that's just limited like one lab and then like straight into the camera it's really shitty audio like the mark ii canon 5d was not good uh, in terms of noise uh, but let me just play that for you so you can see how it's it's made even if we elect a prophet or a saint you know i mean but under the current system it's not gonna change when you have no justice with poverty, that makes it so much worse. You know, in the Quran, for example, even Satan has the right to speak. <laughs> <laughs> the world supported our dictator, called him a democratic leader, a man of peace a stable regime and this did not really help us we are a great nation with a great history we want to be free like you that's it we deserve to be free yeah so for most part like this whole film was shot in interview situations most of the time so pretty controlled environments most of the time where you actually could like have decent audio out of a crappy mic and I think what you need to do most of the time is adapt to like your equipment as much as you can 
So if you don't have the opportunity to shoot in like noisy environments or places where like there's uh, not an opportunity to shoot with uh, like crappy microphones, then you need to adapt to that and, and make like the scenes uh, work in other places. That's usually how I try to think about it because like you can record on a really crappy mic and you can still get good audio as long as the situation is all right. So if it's a quiet room, you can do that. So depending on like having interviews, not having interviews, that's going to dictate like how the audio will be. Uh, I would also go as like, so far so that I would maybe film everything and then I would go back and I would shoot uh, or record just a voiceover with the characters afterwards with like a like proper sound equipment, just like a proper uh, XLR microphone or uh, what have you and a small recorder and just record that like as pickups uh, because then you will get a crisp audio that sounds like a blockbuster type of, of thing but you can't get that when you're in the field and when you're running around especially with low budget so that's one thing I would do another thing I would do is sound design the whole thing so I would really take my time to really strip away all the audio that I can, like everything, everything, and then just redo everything in post. That's also uh, another way to make your film sound much, much bigger. And then where I would keep the sound that you record on locations would be where it's like necessary and crucial. But what this also does, because uh, it doesn't only like save the audio, it also creates like much more cinematic scenes because you don't rely on audio and, and what they say all the time. So you actually need to edit and tell stories with the whole cinematic language of film, not just like, okay, I have, this is what they're saying. And then I have these nice B-roll shots of that. No, you tell the story with like sound and, and movement and picture and everything together. And then you try to show that instead of telling the audience everything. And the more you work on that, like the better the story will be or the more emotional it's going to be. Uh, so that's probably the things I would think about in terms of like audio. Another thing would be to maybe look at the lab video I did on like how to mount the lab. Because most people mount them really badly and there's a lot of noise. Like you will always get better in like audio if you can have it visible because you don't risk noise and all that uh, so that's another thing I always use like a directional mic like a shotgun mic as a backup and then I use labs on the subject and that usually works like it, it doesn't have to be like a bigger thing than that uh, and if you just have one mic I would go with the lab every time like the Tascam whatever it's called that's similar to this one I would buy that one a uh, small recorder thing with a mic but decent enough um, just because like you want crisp audio you want the best audio you can get and in terms of light if you don't have light and you don't have the experience of lighting things I don't know if that necessarily is the thing that you should do uh, like I would probably use just ambient lighting uh, so let's say you have the natural light that's in a room and what I would do to make that like something that you can shoot would be to just like s bounce a light into the ceiling just to get everything up a little bit like all the highlights uh, or all the shadows up a little bit closer to the highlights uh, so that you can expose somewhere in the middle just to get a little bit ambience up in terms of levels if you do that then you're a bit on the way because it takes so much more practice to actually be able to light things and especially in a documentary setting it's really really hard uh, it takes a lot of practice so that's the first step I would take like do that and another thing I would do if you want to get good at lighting start using a gaffer like that's the best way to learn things because they're so freaking good and so freaking efficient and if you just observe what they do and learn from them then awesome you can probably find people who want to do that for free and want to be part of projects um, yeah so for that I would say, yeah, those things. Um, so, let me see. Uh, 
I'm shooting a Dean and ask. I'm shooting a short doc about a stand-up comedian who became one after a failed suicide. He's growing in the scene now. Uh, it's all about his past. But should I shoot for a year documenting his journey? I think generally, like my recommendation would probably be to shoot until you feel you have something. Um, like be patient with that. Like wait for things to actually tell you that you have something. It's it's usually like just by going out and shooting and working and trying to find the story, going back to the edit room, testing things out. That's how you find uh, the story. At least that's how I I often see it. Um, yeah. If you only can choose one MFT lens for documentary filmmaking, which one would you choose? SLR Magic 12 millimeter. I think that's so hard. I actually like this one though. This is the shittiest lens you can buy. I can't even manually focus it. 30, 12 to 32 Panasonic, but it's so convenient. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how do you get the most out of the little things you have and no budget uh, filmmaking? Use the light, crucial, like learn how to master natural light. I would say just like start with having one light to just get the ambience up. Use windows as a base, so just work with the windows, move around to use them as the main source of light. Uh, use practicals in a room like this one for instance that's just a light you could balance them and all that as well but use practicals to make create depth in rooms um, and also shoot at the right time of day that's super super important uh, and i would if you can i would just like if you want it more cinematic just use one light one light will create like the type of cinematic shots that you're after maybe two but one light usually is is like what uh, the sun creates, like that type of source. So don't start like over lighting things. Um, and if you have two lights, then you can light the background. But you can just as well use practicals. Uh, and then I would also like play with the technology that's there like play with filters all those things to create a style as well um, like there's so much that you can do like with light filters for instance this one that's like cyan like start playing with those things and start shooting at like different type of uh, environments or scenes where there are like weird lights just to get things more interesting um, but then you, sh you also need to be like more intentional with what you shoot. So by picking a scene at a certain time of day and all that, you will get the right light and the right location and the right audio. Like you wouldn't want to shoot in night, for instance, in a summer place where there's crickets. Like think about those things if you want to have like most out of the, the little money you have. You need to kind of adapt to those things as well. There's so many things that can destroy uh, a film look at uh, oh what's it called when uh, terry gilliam was making don quixote i don't remember what it's called somebody probably knows but it's a behind the scenes uh, documentary uh, about that process where everything goes wrong everything watch it um yeah and you have to be cost effective you have to refuse to spend money yeah, and just be like bothering things and just work with what you have. Whatever camera you have, shoot with that. And if you can borrow a better camera, maybe you should. But I've always considered like everything that I own is what I'm going to make my next film with. Um, and then I work from that. I've never tried to like grasp like new equipment for things. For like everything I do as like freelance, that's how I... I usually buy equipment for those things and then they come in handy for a film later down the line but i never buy anything uh, for like a film project because i know that i'm not going to make it back so i try to like do things on the side that can fund it but not the other way around uh, 25 bucks issues related to syncing dialogues and how to fix lighting a lot of lighting or use of diy lights 
Yeah, if you do narrative work, I would definitely uh, try to get a gaffer on board. Uh, and if there's a gaffer that has their own equipment or a DUP that has their own equipment, then awesome. Otherwise, like, I wouldn't go out and try to light things in an advanced way. I would keep it as simple as you can. Uh, but in terms of like syncing dialogues, this is what we did on TV all the time that we did like reality documentaries. That's the only thing that worked as a team because like who's gonna have time for the clapper and when somebody's running somewhere and you need to go. Like if you're a team more than you, like I clap myself as well. I do this uh, because I just have one hand and then I hold the camera in one hand and then I just have this left. So that's how I clap. Um, that's something you can do. You can also use like time code generators, um, but those can be a little bit more expensive. So I wouldn't say that that's like no budget type of thing, but um, otherwise like there are ways of piping the same audio that you get into the camera and then piping it to the dual audio source and then using that as well uh, to have it easier uh, automated when you do the waveform syncing so if you at least can have the same audio in both of them then you're gonna have a much bigger chance of just syncing it just with a click of a button in whatever pluralize or whatever you use um, but that's uh, it's a pain in the ass to sync everything but I just do it that way uh, usually like I use time code generators but sometimes it doesn't work so a lot of the time I think it's it's too complicated on the documentary shoot to keep track of everything. There's nobody logging things and you don't, I at least don't have like a second operator doing the audio and somebody logging that and, and organizing it. So in the end, I'll just come back and I start looking at the scenes and I, I need to figure out like, what is this audio? What's this wave file here? And then I start to go through that and I start to listen and then eventually I sync it. It doesn't take that much time. So anybody that kind of complains about it, like syncing everything manually, I, I don't get that because I do it all the time and it just takes a couple of minutes and then it's done. So if you know what you need and what you're looking for, it's not that hard. Yeah. And if you feel like it's hard, then clap. It's not harder than that. If you have like a clapper board or whatever, use that then. But um, I would just like do what works for you. Uh, for me, it's more efficient to not do it, to just shoot and solve it later. That works for me. And it is pain in the ass to do it that way, but it works. Um, Ed Janisevsky. Hopefully it didn't destroy that too much. Um, I'm more interested in learning, improving my storytelling process uh, than I am ab about gear. I like gear, but I'm ready to let gear be a limitation. Um, but it's... Okay, uh, I'm confused. Either because one has gear they think is good or because they don't have the latest, greatest. Yeah, that's true. Uh, my aspirations are not to be a pro filmmaker, but to rather improve my ability to tell a story with the gear I have, uh, which is older and not anything special, but it's arguably sharper, richer, more usable, more affordable, more accessible than what I've been, what has been available to the average person since the beginning of movie making. Yeah, I mean, the thing is. Storytelling is such a hard thing to, to kind of master. It takes just practice, 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 practice. So the best thing you can do is start making films and don't like procrastinate and don't wait for like, okay, I need to tell the right story. I need to tell the perfect story. Just go out and tell stories. That's how you get better. Like just making films all the time is how you improve. Uh, and just sitting and waiting and having this great idea that doesn't happen like there's not many geniuses like that um, i've made films like i made fiction films uh, i wanted to show something from one of them but i didn't but w a person that uh, i co-directed the first like short film with uh, i dop'd one of his uh, his feature films and 
that's fiction. And I think that the, the issue that we had with that first film, and I think that he had with his first film, uh, is that you sit on this ID for so long and you think that like on paper it's really, really good. And then you do that no budget thing for years. You're like, you, you really think that this is the big breakthrough. Like this is my Tarantino moment. And then you sit on that for years and develop it and, and you just plan it and you invest everything, your whole soul and apartment and, and all those things. Um, and then when that doesn't happen, you break. Like you, you don't want to make more films. Like that happens to a lot of people. They make one film and then they don't make a second one. And that like short term, whoa, short term thinking that doesn't really work if you want to make films long term. Uh, like this camera was good enough back in the day. Like it's fun still, but I wouldn't go out and shoot a feature film with it. Too expensive, the media. But I just think that like, shoot with what you have. If that's a phone, then fine. I just think it's clumsy. But some people love their phones. Uh, Ninja Kotajärvi. I have a few ideas for short films. My budget is non-existent. And I have... Oh, sorry. I need to just pause, pause, pause. So last question about storytelling. D besides practicing, like you should probably focus on making personal stories. Because that's how you tell the best stories. So if you can tell a personal story, then you're going to get a push just because you have the details, you have the nuances. Don't try to tell stories about other people until you master it on yourself, I think. Okay, on to the next one. I have a few ideas for short films. My budget is non-existent and I have a DSLR with limited video capabilities. Uh, I would need a gimbal, actors, props and also better camera will not hurt. Where should I start? Would Working with a company that makes gear be an option. I've never made anything before, so I have no guarantee of an audience. So how would they benefit? And how would you go about funding, finding crew, location, film community? Okay, so the thing is, it's really hard to make your first film without like, I would say with, with an intention of, of breaking through and, and like making something amazing that people will pick up and you'll get into festivals and all that. It's so freaking hard that I would not like bet my life on that. I would just start making that first film with whatever, whatever you have at the moment uh, and start making uh, with the smallest type of ID as well. Like if you want to make fiction films, then don't focus on the gear and props and, and all that. Don't focus on gimbals and, and actors. Maybe one, you might need one or two, but focus on making it so sh like small and universal and try to tell a story that actually evokes emotion in, in people and, and get people invested in, in the story without the gear. If you can do that first, it's going to be so much easier to get all the other stuff, but you need to make that first thing. And if you wait and wait and wait until you have everything in place, then it's probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's just my advice on it. But when you do progress, then like when you have that type of passion projects that you can show, it's much easier to get people on board. It's really hard otherwise if you don't have uh, like certain type of um, resume. Uh, it's super hard. Okay, so story. Just, there's probably one book that everybody should read. Uh, it takes like a couple of reads for me to really understand everything. Story by Robert McKee. But just to like kind of condense what a story is, like in terms of uh, how you create a good documentary story. Like things that people make mistake of doing is, is like rushing into the story when they make films. So they're not spending time on the setup long enough so that you care about the character and that it's li a likable character that you're going to care about 
the character once like shit starts to happen because like usually you need that conflict but you don't okay you can like you can show the conflict to to get people in interested in the story in the beginning just uh, as something that uh, piqued their interest but before you like start telling the story and start digging into it you need to spend time with a character so that's like one crucial thing that i would say in terms of like telling a story uh, and i would also like have like spend time on the premise or like short synopsis that you have because that premise is the story and you should stick to that in terms of the story narrative throughout the film. Don't go out and like on tangents all the time, like stick to that. Like everything that you do, every scene that you shoot, everything that you try to, to uh, create as a scene should come back to that. Shouldn't be something that's totally random just because it's a nice scene. Then you need to think about like how could that be like meshed together with with that and that usually is possible but sometimes people are lazy and don't do that uh, i am too uh, and then like f in the beginning i think that, that it's crucial to grab people's attention and however you do that but look at steven spielberg how he introduces characters like it's so amazing uh, how he just like makes this crazy f like fantasy type of uh, of scenes just so that you get like a cinematic vision into this person like look at how you can introduce the characters and and then also like get people's attention through the conflict and everything and yeah don't rush into the story yeah, but also like doing docs you need to research uh, in order for you to find all these things if you don't research then you're gonna take like shortcuts all the time yeah, and like if you want to save money and make like no budget films doing the research is the cheapest thing that you can do and for me i usually nowadays i i have some money so i can actually spend it wisely on uh, saving money <laughs> like spending money to save money but if you don't have any money then like the way that you do research is either yourself or you need to collaborate with like ngos or something like that for that type of stories or any interest organization or or anybody that's interested in your topic collaborate with people uh, for me i just hire somebody that can location uh, manage and also be the costing person on the ground so i don't have to travel and do the pre-interviews with people because that gets really expensive since i i usually shoot somewhere else in the world so if you actually can get somebody that's local and you can research all this online of course and if you can get that person either to be on your project as like a yeah, it from the beginning maybe not that expensive even then that's a good thing to have because you will have somebody local that can go and meet with people and keep the connections and everything uh, alive um, yeah and then just costing takes time so patience with that as well uh, Ruben Lopez storytelling inspiration what kept you going in the face of bankruptcy yeah I answered that one I probably added that one um yeah but in terms of like storytelling inspiration i just try to live life and i try to like do things all the time mix things up that's how i stay like consistent with things uh, if you always do things like uh, things are happening all the time and, and then you don't get bored of things yeah lost in la mancha is what the documentary film with the uh, uh, Don Quixote behind the scenes check it out amazing um, Damien Reyes asks I think the iPhone is less intimidating than a camera for interviews for example it fits your pocket so it's easier to film in any place but if you film with an iPhone you probably are in no budget or low budget party the thing like iPhone iPhones are amazing like you can shoot amazing videos with this that is better than the short film that I went to Cannes with and you could probably like do massive amount of like festivals and all that type of stuff just from shooting like a really good looking film on an iPhone other people have done that already there are so many films that are like 
amazingly looking but okay this holding this it has a negative effect as well because people don't take you serious as a filmmaker when you do that uh, and that's just in general and it it doesn't come down to like this as a as a tool because when we shot zero silence i had the 5d and everybody at Tahrir square in egypt was just saying no to having interviews with us at first because we had such a small camera and then the other cameras was kicked out and we were left in there and then everybody wanted to do interviews with us so sure there is like a purpose in that sense i think like having this camera for instance going into a convenience store where you are not allowed to shoot anything or if you're in la and people are like chasing you around with a camera you can't go anywhere and shoot but you can with an iphone then if you're making a film like that, it makes sense. But otherwise, I think that like iPhone filmmaking is a bad idea because it's clumsy, it's complicated, it's limited, like unnecessarily limited. It's as expensive or even more expensive than this one. Uh, and it's not a natural step towards being a professional filmmaker, working with lenses and apertures and, and all those things. If you work with a camera like this, that's the natural progression. Like you work with this, you have something that's actually something that's mimicking a bigger camera. And even if you're on this one, you're far from like the Ursa or anything in terms of like equipment. But I just think that it makes no sense to me to work on iPhones just for like the intrusiveness or or for instance like it's a cheap technology or it's the new technology like everybody would shoot on this in the future i don't see that i see the quality in it and i see the potential in it but i just think it's always going to be a camera that has the smartphone technology it's not going to be a smartphone that has the camera technology yeah, this i think i think somebody said this on uh, in social media now when I asked about iPhone filmmaking or um, no budget filmmaking this is what the dads used to shoot with their super 8 type of cameras back in the days this is like a great camera a great tool if this is the only thing you have but I wouldn't spend the money that you spend on an iPhone instead of spending it on this one and if I did, I would go back to work and I would work a little bit longer and I would go out and I would buy this one. Like it doesn't make sense just because it's uh, cheap-ish. It, it's, it's not a professional quality image. It's not a professional workflow. Everything is just clumsy. So that's just my rant on, on iPhones and everything. But I know all of you do not agree on that, but that's just my thoughts on it. It's clumsy to me. It's just like you have to rig it. You have to find a cage and stuff. It's just clumsy with audio to record that. Sure, you have these like I rig uh, things and, and like you have good quality audio, but this is messy. I don't even like uh, this one. And this is super professional. Like there's so many things that uh, yeah, I can't spend more time talking about iPhones. <laughs> anyway, so. Mm, let me see do you ever check your email ah, not that often like andre handles most of of my stuff in terms of like booking things and and doing all that so i'm terrible with email sometimes i answer most of the time i don't answer um, it's just like many emails i don't even clear it out anymore i just let it Maybe they grow with age or something. I don't know. I hate emails. Almost as not as much as phone calls. Maybe do a syncing tutorial. Uh, yeah, I think can definitely do that. Um, can you talk about how hard it was to get Netflix on board with your doc? Yeah, it was like a l super long process. Like first, how did it begin? I emailed the boss of uh, documentaries. Or was it of the whole? No, I think I emailed the boss of, uh, boss of the boss. Uh, and then that's like my strategy in general. It's just like email the top and then they will like forward you to somebody else. And then they will feel like obliged to answer. Um, and then that happened. But I had a pitch at this stage and I had like a trailer and I had something to, to show. 
So I sent her that, she forwarded it to her programmers, original programmers at Netflix. Uh, one of them uh, responded. We had like a long conversation for like well over a year, I think, and was trying to schedule a Skype. So when, when that happened, it's easy to like, oh yeah, so pissed off, not answering or like just get tired of the whole process. They're not interested, you think. But that's not really why they do that. They're so busy and they have so many projects. And it's the same if you try to get an agent uh, in a different city, they prioritize the people that are there. And it's, it's just the way it, it goes. So we didn't manage that uh, meeting at all. Like we were trying to get that Skype going so we could talk about the project. And I wasn't at rough cut stage. It wasn't uh, like urgent for them. It's urgent for me as a filmmaker, but for them, it's not urgent. So then eventually I'm just like, okay, so I'm on my way to a film festival uh, in New Orleans. And I just th thought, okay, so let's, uh, let's just drop an email and say that I'm going to be in LA for a couple of days. And if she answers and I want to meet, I'll go to LA and hang out for a couple of days. And then I did that uh, because she answered. Uh, but then I got there and then, yeah, it was... Uh, cancelled and I had to chase her all the time that I was there and then eventually I managed to get the meeting I went to their office and then I pitched the whole project and then we kind of stayed in touch but then that like she quit and uh, all that died uh, and then I was trying to get like that going again but then eventually we got into a festival uh, and then we tried to pitch it at that time and then it didn't happen and then it went like a couple of months later we had our european premiere and then we knew that okay this is our last chance to get anything to happen so then we went with an aggregator uh, that at the same time as we were there having our european premiere where we were inviting a lot of tv and all that like everything from bbc to pov and and all these people um, and then at the same time we pressured netflix to make a decision so the aggregator went to them they usually pitch like a couple of projects each month so it's not a, it's not a big aggregator that pitches everything they're super selective so then they pitched it and then they came back with an offer uh, while we were at the festival and then yeah that was done but th like it was a long process of probably like two or three years so stick in there um Let's see. Do you think it's a good starting point to start with a short story, a chapter of a novel? Always want to find something that I want to tell uh, that I like a lot, but I don't know how to write well. Uh, yeah, Benjamin asks. I think that like short stories are amazing if you want to learn things and if you want to be productive, they're amazing. It's definitely the best best way of doing things is just like do short stories all the time do a lot of things like different things just learn things all the inspiration that i have in, in like the way i make films now comes from me doing everything like i've done docs i've done fiction i've done music videos i've done all types of stuff and then like i take a little bit of of from all of those things yeah. and especially when you work as a dop on things Okay, so I take like this from this director, uh, this was smart from this director, and then you like take that into your craft. So just doing everything and trying different roles and all that will develop you. But then when it comes time and you feel like, okay, so now I, I want to make this into a career. I think that short films, if you can make it a viral hit, it can be like a really good way to go. But for the most part, it's such a long road to get to a feature from a short film. So I wouldn't recommend it, especially if you do docs. Uh, if that's what you want to make, if you want to make docs, spend time to get one feature film made and that will like get you way ahead of anybody doing short docs. Because it's not the same thing. You don't go through the same type of process in distribution and all those things. And you won't have anything on your resume that's worthwhile if you don't get into like the big festivals and that type of stuff. So I would say like do small projects to learn and then like make a big project. Just do it. It's it's uh, you learn so much from it and uh, you need that first project to, to kind of get ahead, I think. 
because once you're in the festival with a big project you start to see how the industry works and i would say like your second or your third is where you're you know trying to to make a living off of making films i still don't like i make some money but i don't make a living exclusively off of making my own films um but now we're trying to make more tv as well and then that might be easier because we have like two tv projects now that we've pitched and then we have uh, two feature films so or maybe it's tv series and a feature film and all those are like running parallel to each other so that's also a way to do things is have always have like four or even more projects because some go and they go on hold for a while and then you come back to them like maybe five years from now and then you go on like that forever and ever um let's see adm reyes when you go to a person and say i want to make a documentary about you and your story and i have no budget uh, they tend to feel like you're just playing or non-professional it takes time and work for them to trust you any advice on that mm. of course it's easier if you can say that you have uh, this and that like on your resume but and that's why a personal brand is is important i think but besides that i think that it it just comes down to, to having patience with people and, and like going and talking to them like when i met with cleo she was super skeptical to me as a white male from sweden coming and doing a, a film about her and her story um, especially since she was an activist and in the activist circles that's like the worst thing you can do is make a film about somebody else they want to tell their story so i had to like meet with her first and just i was introduced through a, a friend of hers and then i i got to sit down and explain like my id for the film and how i wanted to make it and how i wanted to kind of collaborate with her and then once i'd done that we were probably talking for like two or three hours just sitting and talking about like what i wanted to can tell with the story and then also trying to get her to uh, tell me how um, how she wanted the story to be and all those things and take that into consideration so i think that's crucial if you want to get their support and and trust spend that time and don't rush things like if if you don't have to bring out the camera straight away don't just hang out with them and spend time and and uh, get their trust first and then you can start like shooting i never have a problem shooting straight away but i would say like that's the the thing that i would really be cautious about is just like spend time and hang out with them like do things go drink coffee beer go ride motorcycles whatever do things that just gets you to become friends rather than uh, like subject and filmmaker and all that um see our stories couldn't agree more i shot a documentary called obstructions no excuses with no money or crew on an entry level dslr i think it's great let me know what you think uh, you'll find there on my page any tips on how to distribute a film keep in mind no budget i think for anybody without a budget and without an audience you need to either like you should probably do both but festivals are great if you want to build uh, a reputation and a name in the industry i don't think necessarily that you find an audience there i don't think that's why you go to festivals uh, i think that's like w why you used to go to festivals but sure that can be a thing but if you go to a festival and there's like 20 people or 50 people or couple of hundred people there's so many more online so in terms of like an audience i would go all for on online uh, but it's really hard to distribute a film and make money especially if it's a, a short film so if it's a documentary i would just like if you're in a rough cut stage because it sounds like you you're finished but if you're in a rough cut stage you could like apply to these programs and you could apply to uh, workshop the whole project 
in a place where there are like mentors and all that if you do that you can build a network and all that and get introduced and and then uh, parallel i would go with markets and try to get it into markets at an early stage before you say it's finished um, and then i would try that route first before i would send to festivals if you don't feel like it's like the most amazing film and want to send it to festivals uh, do that but um, once you get into a festival it's hard to say no uh, and especially if you get into one of the big ones so take your patience before you go to that stage is, is something that i think everybody should think about like don't rush getting uh, the film out there spend the time and tell a story right that's more important uh, because when you get into the markets, it's easier to get distributors on board and it's easier to get sales agents on board and they will have an easier time to get into festivals. They will have an easier time to selling it and distributing it. So that's the way I would go. If you have a more like commercial type of film, then it's easier to get distributors and all that on board before it's finished, especially fiction. If you have names attached and that sort of thing, it's much, much easier. So like talk to distributors and talk to sales agents and yeah, all those and try to figure out like what slots on TV and that sort of stuff is for your film and try to research them on like LinkedIn or something. Who's the commissioning editors at the TV channels and everywhere. That's what I would do. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be it for today. So let me know what you think best no budget filmmaking tips. Um, I think everybody should probably think about going to eBay and buying this little camera here. And that's just because this is so cinematic quality. I know somebody asked why do I not shoot 800 ISO. I think it's much noisier, like substantial amount of noise. So I don't shoot it because of that. I don't know if it's the native ISO but this camera is a beast like I, I linked to the videos before if you're gonna watch one video of all the videos then watch too beautiful the trailer by Macy or Frost and you'll see like the potential of that camera it's insane what you can produce with a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera the last old version not the new one new one seems to be fine as well but uh, I actually got a message let me just read this before I go Oh, so I'm going to watch a draft of a film shot on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K. I'll tell you later about it. See you guys. Bye bye. Until the next time. Ha ha. How excited am I? <laughs>